situations. However, our escape was basketball. If you look at the South, it was just a slower process. The integration was not as accepted in the South as it was in other parts of the country, clearly. We had overt, visible uh, discrimination and segregation in the South. You had individuals with attitudes and feelings that were very racist. And those were some turbulent times from a race standpoint. All over the country, it was during the sit-ins. A lot of people just said, hey, we're not taking this anymore. In a nation that was torn by racial unrest, college basketball was not spared. It was separate, no doubt about it. We couldn't go uh, to a tournament in 1959 when we won it because we had to play, you know, against blacks, and that was a policy. And we were disappointed, but we accepted it. I remember one coach uh, put his arm around me, and he says, look at that crowd up there. They're all white people. If you bring a black ball player in here, we can't play anymore. And recruiting, you were scared of having too many Afro-Americans on the team because then you would have a tough time scheduling. In 1960, on a small Jesuit campus on the north side of Chicago, Loyola University basketball coach George Ireland made a bold decision that transformed college athletics. George Ireland had the gall to assemble a team and run four black guys out there in the court. Four black guys and one white guy. He was not one of these guys that's going to save the black race or anything or whatever. He was losing. In those days, the formula was you could play two or three at home and you could play one on the road, provided you didn't go too deep into the South. But George said, the hell with that. I've got these guys, and I'm going to play them all. A team that happened to have four black starters and one white starter played a whole lot better than the predominantly white team that was replacing. For me, it was refreshing to see so many good players. The fact that uh, they were black, it wasn't real significant to me at that time. I was looking to have a, a great team. But the Ramblers who played the schedule of an independent and frequently traveled outside the Midwest were subject to vile acts of prejudice away from the sanctuary of Loyola's alumni gym. No team from the North with four black players in the starting lineup was going to be treated courteously in the South, in the Southwest. Ireland brought us all in to his office and he says, we're going to have some rough times now. Um, this is what we're going to do. We're going to have to go to separate hotels. We had to ride in a cab with a black driver, and the white guys had to ride in a cab with the white driver. And we, we never saw them until game time. When we had to have a police escort, I thought, what in the world is this world coming to? When they've got people that are human beings and loving people, could they do something like this? Why do they need it? How can they be so damn racist? And that kind of motivated us. I mean, it really did. And plus, we felt we had something to play for. He would tell his kids, you're going to be given racial slurs. And he said, don't mind those. He said, don't, don't poke anybody. Don't get mad, because that's exactly what they want you to do. Instead, rip that ball off the board. And you go up and you make the basket. And at the end of the game, shake their hand, because that's going to get them madder than anything. In Houston, I just was awful. Um, a whole game, because I, I remember at halftime, we're going under, and they're calling us saying, my team is red hot, your team is all black, that was the thing, and they're throwing money on us as we go out. Getting hit with pennies and stuff from the stands, and you almost had to fight your way out after the game was over and after we'd won. They call us a lot of names in Houston. I remember a lady looking at me saying, you nigga. And, you know, just looked me in the face like that and said, you know, the end of the famous N-word, and for no reason at all. Coach Allen told me a story there about the coach who came up to him and said, where'd you get all those niggers? Coach Allen said he didn't appreciate that type of language. But we beat Houston, and I remember after the game, the coach uh, coming to me and apologizing. Coach of Houston, he says, I apologize, I'm sorry, you guys didn't deserve this. Great sports stories are always, you know, have some sort of involvement with, with politics and in some way uh, go to explain the human condition. It's very much the case with this story. In 
those days, as a young black, my dream was if I could get through high school, possibly, and get a job making $100 a week, I would be set for life. Never thought about college. We were afraid to take the first step playing the Afro-American ballplayers and he was one of the forerunners of, of promoting that the African-Americans. I don't think anybody realized the impact of this until they looked out and saw this man dared to put four black players and one white player on the floor. After graduating Notre Dame, George Ireland began his coaching career at Marmion Military Academy in Aurora, Illinois in 1936. He compiled a record of 262 and 87 in 15 seasons and came to appreciate and apply the unbending tenets of authority. And George was a great basketball player, an All-American at Notre Dame, and George went off to a military school where discipline is a way of life. I think that blended into his personality and his character. Ireland became head coach in 1951 and installed the style of play that emphasized unrelenting pressure defense. For 24 seasons, he ran the program with a firmness that bordered on tyranny. We call him the man. We called everybody that we saw as an authority figure, the man. George Allen was coming, here comes the man, straighten up. Ireland blew his whistle and he came stomping out into the court. He didn't yell at him. He pulled him over real close and pulled his jersey down and he whispered something in his ear and Les shook his head. So we got on the other end of the court. I said, hey, I said, what did the man say? Les said, well, the next time he wants me to take a jump shot, he'll send me a telegram. He was indiscriminately tough on everybody. Very outspoken, brash guy, a tyrant. I had to have things his way. Stormy. It was very stormy. I thought he didn't like me, and I knew I didn't like him. I, I used to think that the guy just really had it in for me, uh, when in fact he didn't. I found that he, he treated everybody the same. The point is, Ireland didn't care. He wasn't there to be liked. He was there to help these guys win basketball games. He said that he could count on one hand the friends that he had in this world, and they were all family members. George wanted to know all the time what the players were doing, and he wanted to control where they were eating, whom they were dating, where they were getting haircuts, everything about their lives. A lot of the New York kids came back to school with afros, and uh, he asked them to cut it. He's telling me he doesn't want to be my best friend, and he wants to just be successful together, and if there's friendship that develops, fine. If it doesn't develop, that's fine, too. But after nine seasons, his record was a pedestrian 107 and 106. Concerned that his job might be in jeopardy, he took a daring risk by recruiting more African-American players. And he came in and he looked around and he said, I better get some players or I'll be going back to high schools pretty soon. She could see it coming when George Ireland, the coach, started to recruit the Afro-American players, whom he had not previously had. He wanted to win. And we, although we respected him being one of the first to do that, we also knew that he was doing it also for himself. As being hung in effigy by the students of Loyola and being knocked down for not winning, uh, you, you take chances, and he did with us, and as a result, we won for him. I don't think he was so much a pioneer as just knew who was a better ball player. He wanted his legacy to be that he saw something that nobody else saw. This was not a team of great players. This was a team of good players who became a great team and his convincing them of what they could accomplish. I think some schools, for whatever reason, weren't actively recruiting black players. Uh, they went after some of the great stars like Oscar Robertson and Bill Russell, but they would never recruit any more than maybe two. Coach George Ireland expanded his recruiting base and gradually worked more black players into Loyola's basketball program. The talent level rose quickly in the early 1960s. George Ireland had to have friends out around the country who would send him players. And there was a fellow in 
New York City named a Walter November. And Walter November sent him Jerry Harkness when nobody else would look at Jerry Harkness. November sincerely wanted to help uh, these young guys out and placed them in, in positions where they could get an education as well as play basketball. Have you ever seen poetry in motion? Jerry Harkness was poetry in motion. He was fabulous. He could make moves that would have the other people standing still. And you had such great athletes coming out of New York at the time. Art Heyman, Billy Cunningham, I mean, Doug Moe. Just so much talent, and I was lost in the talent. Jerry Harkness lived on a 12th floor of a housing project. Now think about this, and was the New York State cross-country champion. He came down from the 12th floor on an elevator to become a great cross-country runner and was a wonderfully proficient high school basketball player. Harkness did not go right from high school into college, even though he had good grades and was a good citizen. He stayed out of college and, and played some amateur ball until Walter November found this place for him. Well, George Ireland came down, and I played horrible the game he came, but he saw some things in me, and he gave me that opportunity. He gave me a scholarship because of this guy, Walter November, saying, this guy is tough. Ireland raided the South to tap the rich pipeline that stocked the black schools. He went to Nashville, Tennessee, for two players who became pillars of his team. I had scholarship offers to Tennessee State and Fisk University, uh, two traditionally black schools. Didn't have any offers from Vanderbilt, which was a mile and a half from my home, or from the University of Tennessee because they were segregated at that time. Well, Hunter wanted to go to Tennessee State, but Les had to get in line. There was so much talent going to the black colleges at the time because they were not accepted in the in most of the white colleges i went to high school with a guy by the name of vic rouse who played on the team and we decided to go away to college together and we decided that loyola would take both of us as a package deal so we decided to head out for chicago Ireland told me uh we got a surprise and they came in the door. This guy, 6'9", Les Hunter, big, strong looking, and Rouse, I said, oh my gosh. And, and Ireland told me, these are the surprises. Victor Rouse was the intellectual of the team. Uh, he was kind of a loner. He was by far the best student on the team. You look at his background. And what he came up with, with the polio and the rickets and braces and that hardship, was told he'd never walk again uh, without the braces, and he fought through all of that. He brought that to the team. The catalyst for this intriguing cast turned out to be the most unlikely of the bunch. A feisty little Irish guard from Chicago's St. Rita High School. Jack Egan was a lightweight basketball player, and he came to level. <laughs> and astonishingly, he became the leader of the team. But a guy that would get into their face was little Johnny Egan. I mean, I'm telling you, that little Irishman would say, hey, that's enough of this. Now, I told you, let's do it. Now, you hear me? And, and these are bigger guys, you know, almost twice his size. And when you do it, they'd listen. That prize quartet of recruits, Egan, Miller, Rouse, and Hunter, had to wait a year before they were eligible to join Harkness on the varsity. So they spent the 1961 season crushing freshman opponents, a foreshadowing of what was to come. And after having seen our varsity and, and other varsity teams, I, I thought that our team could compete with most teams that uh, I had seen in my freshman year. I don't think they lost a game that year. Yeah, they played pretty tough competition, but uh, we knew the following year we were going to be real good. You could see then that this class, when it joined Jerry Harkness, was going to be something special. And they looked awesome. I just felt in my heart that the losing days are over for Loyola. With four black starters, Loyola posted a 23-4 record and a number 11 ranking in the 1961-62 season. And the next 
year ripped through its schedule with a fearsome fast break that trampled the opposition and generated headlines. Every day in the paper you'd see something, what's that big ruckus out at Loyola? Because we were like 17 and 0, 18 and 0, got all the way to 20 wins straight and I, I think we carried the banner of a lot of black people. They routed teams along the way and once they were rolling, it, you felt sorry for the opposition. You'd think, uh, well they ought to call this off. It's not fair. And we thought we were the best team in the country. We knew we had a really good team, a really special team. They averaged 93 points a game. <laughs> you think about that today. They didn't have a three-point field goal. They didn't have a clock controlling the game. <laughs> Ireland's team played scorched earth basketball. The Ramblers took neither prisoners nor arrest. <laughs> you had five ball players and you played five. If you played in overtime, they played five more minutes, that's all. The only way a sixth person got into the game was if somebody was hurt or fouled out of the game or the game was over one way or the other. Otherwise, five guys went the whole distance, Iron Man team. There were times when we wouldn't have to run an offensive play for four or five minutes at a time because we broke up what other teams were doing, stole the ball from them three, four times in a row. My role was to run, at all times run, on both on defense and on offense. To make sure that we are moving, not standing, not dribbling. We had Duke by 30-something, my goodness. I mean, had all these teams that were representing their conference. And then we had Tennessee Tech by 70. We just came together and we knew each other. As they rolled up the routes, the Ramblers found themselves becoming symbols, not just for the school, but for the black community. You live with these guys, and we were getting better, and the experiences that brought us closer together were racial experiences, and it made us better. We got like 23,000 people at a doubleheader uh, in Chicago Stadium, and then you could look in the stands and you saw 50, 60 percent black. I don't think that was the case before that. I think black Chicago was rooting for us, pulling for us. They had never seen a good team, let alone a good team with black players. But other sections of the country, especially the South, did not share Chicago's fervor for the Loyola juggernaut. George knew he had a great gate attraction because people were going to come out in the South to see these Negras get their comeuppance. New Orleans was a place where everything was segregated. So the whole time we were there, we were conscious of the, um, the race problem in New Orleans. We got to the stadium, and there were blacks on one side and whites on the other. And that kind of motivated us. Coach Aaron was trying to make a statement about that. And the way he attempted to make a statement was that he was going to show that our team was absolutely going to devastate my all of New Orleans team. He really liked to pour it onto those teams. He had to make a statement with the ball players he had. We pressed full court in one game, the full game. But after getting up, uh, say, 30 points, it was time maybe we should back off the press a little bit. The message that he was trying to impart really wasn't a message for the Lyola of New Orleans team. It was for the city. And I, I don't know if they got the message. All of the uh, black uh, spectators came down and cheered us on. Uh, it was just a beautiful view. It brought tears to my eyes. Loyola's utter domination only infuriated the bigots and inflamed the Ku Klux Klan. Ireland got wind of it and came over and said, any mail from these guys that is suspicious, you give it to me. He took all of the mail. There was a lot of hate mail. I saw a bunch of articles. I saw a death threat letters that he had received when we were playing uh, because we were starting uh, four black guys and we were successful. And it just made us stronger. And ironically enough, we were good anyway. But when you have factors like that coming in, it makes you better. 
they had a resolve, they had a, an, a bond between them that said, we're going to get there. Nobody's going to beat us. Now let's get it done. Finishing the 1963 regular season 24 and 2 and ranked third in the country, Loyola received its first ever bid to the NCAA tournament. The Ramblers responded by destroying Tennessee Tech by 69 points. But their second round opponent remained a mystery. The brackets came out, and you could see that the Southeastern Conference champion was scheduled to play Loyola in the Mideast Regional. You could see there was another opportunity for the Southern segregation laws to kick in. Certainly 1963 wasn't very far removed from Little Rock, Arkansas, or the events at Ole Miss, or Medgar Evers getting shot in his own driveway. I mean, clearly this wasn't a very peaceful time in the South. I think when you say the word Mississippi back then, uh, it automatically conjured up images of racism. Our governor didn't want us to go. Uh, it was what you call, I guess, an unwritten law is what I've heard. He didn't want us to participate against integrated team. The black athlete in the Southeastern Conference just did not exist. And uh, there was some sentiment around in various parts of the state where the all-white colleges were just not to participate and play against the black athletes. Even though it had won the Southeastern Conference three of the previous four years, Mississippi State was forbidden to play by the state legislature in the NCAA tournament. After winning another SEC title in 1963, the school was threatened with an injunction by Governor Ross Barnett if it dared venture to East Lansing, Michigan to play that integrated team from Chicago. When you were told something as an athlete, uh, it was frustrating at times. It was a big deal to us. But nobody stepped out of line and said, you know, we should or we shouldn't. We just couldn't. That's the way it was. There really was just not a lot of uh, noticeable movement and activity to try to correct that situation. Mississippi State was 21-5 and five and chafing to play on. Coach Babe McCarthy appealed to the Board of Trustees to intervene. He had had enough of the season ending too early where his teams... Uh, notwithstanding the fact that they won the Southeastern Conference, where they were not able to go any further and compete against the major programs. You knew there were some efforts being made to allow us to go. We didn't talk about it a whole lot because uh, I I'm not sure anybody on the team really thought that we were going to get to go. The governor made good on his threat. An injunction was issued to prevent Mississippi State from playing on. But the Maroons had other ideas. They knew it was coming. The rumor was that the, there was going to be an injunction by the state legislature not to, to allow this team to go play in this game. So then they have to be very careful about, you know, how they get around that. We were told by Coach McCarthy that there might be some effort to stop us. Everyone knew that we would be flying to East Lansing, and it was a joint effort with the team and the coaching staff. There was a decision made to set up a decoy, if you will. In a cloak-and-dagger operation, McCarthy drove to Memphis before flying to East Lansing. Some reserves were sent to the Starkville airport to test the injunction. It was sort of a standing joke. When you looked at your teammates, you wondered which one would be used as a decoy and which one would actually be held to make the real trip. The interesting thing about the decoy team was that many members of the team were worried that they were going to be on the decoy team. The decision was made to send some of the trainers and red shirts or other guys who, who weren't enjoying a lot of playing time uh, out to the airport and uh, they uh, were to call back to the dorm where we were waiting and uh, in the vehicles. Uh, if there was a problem, then we had an alternate plan to go to a small private airport. There was always that chance that the deputy sheriffs could show up to arrest you. So it was a real tense situation. Uh, when we got word from the uh, first troops that went to the airport, we found that actually there was no one there attempting to uh, stop us, so everybody loaded up, went to the airport. As it turned out, there was no one at the airport, and the rest of the team came, and, and they went on, went on their way, and met the coach and athletic director, and then on to, to East Lansing. And there's some debate about how uh, vigorously the sheriff's department wanted to serve the injunction, but 
it still speaks volumes to the folks at Mississippi State that they were willing to do all those things to play in that game. I kind of felt sorry for, for the black kids on Loyola because, uh, you know, they were young too. They may have thought that we thought we were better than they was or something because we hadn't come in. But it wasn't us that was doing it. I was of the opinion that Coach Ireland was in that state again, that state that he was in when we went to New Orleans, that he really wanted to do something because of the political situation. Jerry Harkness explained that the players were being threatened by the Ku Klux Klan. They were also receiving pressure from uh, their own alumni, basically saying, hey, you know, this is an important game from a social standpoint, so don't lose. When I really felt it is when I shook the hand of the captain of Mississippi State and so many bulbs went on. I mean, boom, boom, blah, blah, boom. And I couldn't quite understand that. And then I, in my mind, I said, this is, this is history. There was a lot of speculation what was going to happen in the game. Nothing happened in the game except that it was well played, cleanly played. And to this day, I commend the players on both sides to be able to concentrate on playing basketball with all the things that were swirling around on the periphery. The publicity in Mississippi was that they should not go. And then they came up, and they were physical, but I don't think they were as physical as they would want to be or normally are. We found out right quick that we had some good, quick basketball players on the Loyola team. That the stall didn't bother them like it had some of the other teams we played. Loyola won 61 to 51. But like the making of most history, the participants didn't fully realize at the time the import of what they had done. I wasn't raised in a bubble. I mean, I did understand that it was a significant step for the state of Mississippi. But I, I'm not sure I had a real background of how significant it was going to be. I can't truthfully say that, that I felt and that any other team members felt like we were making history or we were going to go out and change the world. I'm sure it was some said we shouldn't have gone, but uh, the majority felt it was a good thing that we played. They actually faced penalty of imprisonment uh, just to come play a basketball game. And uh, I think a lot of people should be thankful that somebody took a stand like Mississippi State. Mississippi State, Loyola defeated Big Ten champion Illinois by 15 points and number two ranked Duke by 19 to reach the NCAA title game. Awaiting the Ramblers was two-time defending national champion Cincinnati. Ranked number one all season, the Bearcats led by All-Americans Ron Bonham and Tom Thacker were 26 and one. Going to the game, we had all the confidence in the world that was gonna win the third national championship and become the first in history ever win three straight in a row. So now it was just an obstacle in our way, and we felt that we could remove them as we did the previous years. They were just a, a great team, and they had great passing, but I don't think they had the quickness that Loyola had, and I don't think they quite had the unselfishness of Loyola. Well, the confidence level was great. I mean, we believed going into the game that we could beat Loyola. The emphasis uh, placed on our team was defense, and we had been very successful defensively for, for the past three years. And I knew that we were evenly matched. I mean, I, I knew that they, I certainly didn't think this was going to be a blowout, that we were going to kill them or something. The game was played in Freedom Hall in Louisville, Kentucky, and was televised nationally. Believe it or not, it was a delayed TV game where it was on radio first, and people knew who won the game before the game was over on TV. The ball's in the air and controlled by Cincinnati 28. This is the first time my family could see me from Harlem in New York and all of the guys I grew up with in the projects. Harkness, here goes a three on three. Harkness drives the baseline, and he has to wait. He holds up. Passes back up. Loyola missed 13 of its first 14 shots and was fortunate to trail only 29-21 at halftime. I remember seeing Les's face and Les sitting there like shaking his head and, you know, like in disbelief that it was that bad. And I remember Jerry uh, saying something like, come on now, we can get these guys. That's a conservative statement, an awful first half. The first half of the game, in using today's terminology, we sucked. 
left to go. Egan, a 25-footer, up, off, no good. And the ball controlled by Thacker underneath. They're getting the boards. There's no question about it. Harkness didn't hit anything. He was shut out. The first half, Bonham was hot. George Wilson was controlling the boards. He was getting the rebounds away from Hunter and Rouse. Everything was going Cincinnati's way. They had all of our plays down pat. I remember Thacker telling me, now come over here where I was supposed to go, and I hadn't gone there yet. And he told, now come over here, now go over there. I mean, he's just playing with me. And that got in my mind. Jerry Hart was a top player, a top gun. That's the player we sort of mainly concentrated on. And uh, we shut him down. I remember most the disappointment that I had that we weren't executing. We just weren't doing it. Larry down in the corner to Bonham. He jumps an 18 footer. is up and good. 45 to 30. Cincinnati lengthened its lead to 15 with 14 minutes left. And Jerry Harkness, the All American, still had not scored. And I'm over there almost in tears. And in my mind, I'm thinking of my mother, all of my front friends, and, and home, all of the Patterson projects. I said, I'm letting them down. I really wasn't sure if we could win it. With 10 minutes left to go in the game, my thought was, come on, let's, let's get this close. Give ourselves a chance. Now let's not go back and this embarrassed. Back to Egan in front of our sports microphone. Egan jumps from 12 out. No good. Egan gets the rebound. Fake. Plays it up and scores. We felt that we were in, in total control, uh, which we were at that point in time. We had complete momentum and complete confidence that we were going to win that game. However, things changed drastically. Like Loyola, Cincinnati rarely used its bench. But when center George Wilson picked up his fourth foul, he was replaced with 10 minutes left and would sit for four minutes. It was the only substitution of the game. A foul is called on George Wilson, and that is four. There was an opportunity for the Ramblers. All of a sudden, Loyola started chipping away at the lead. 13 points, 11, so what? Nine. Cincinnati... The tortoise remained in its shell. It is called keep away. Come out and get me if you can. One finger is up. 7.01 left to go. 48.37. The baseline. Thacker's got it. He doesn't want to shoot it. He drives in, however. He fakes, turns around, shoots up off no good, and Leslie Hunter clears it. And somehow or other, they got a little cocky, and they start maybe taking a couple of shots they should have never taken. Harkness, now with six minutes to go, hits two baskets right in succession. Boom, boom. But it's the truth. Egan, in to Harkness, turn around, jumper's good! Gary made his first basket! Backer with that ball. Passing down, intercepted by Harkness. Here goes Gary, lays it up, and he scores! Harkness scores! Gary Harkness scores! He scores! Gary Harkness, beautiful, beautiful! All of a sudden, you could see the lift that Harkness's baskets gave Loyola. Yeah, and the crowd had turned for us, uh, where it was kind of a half and half. And all of a sudden, when you're 15 down, you're really the underdog. They're screaming for this, these cats from Second City that are making this charge from behind against the, the favored and defending champions. It was bedlam there. They went into a stall. <laughs> That's what was amazing. And even with them going into a stall, they knew we couldn't come out and press them because we all got four fouls. Cincinnati led 53-52 with 12 seconds to play. And Larry Shingleton had a one-and-one. One. He made the first but missed the second, leaving Loyola with a chance to tie. Larry Eisen shoots it. It is off. No good. And Leslie Hunter has got it. To Ron Miller. That second one went off and Hunter went up and he gave it to Miller. And Thacker always reminds me when I don't see him, Tom, Miller ran with it. And I'm waiting for the whistle for traveling. And it never came. And it was a key moment in the game. It was things like that, uh, some of the things that uh, didn't happen or weren't called, that I think really provided the, the lift that we needed. To Ron Miller, they got a fast break down to Harkin. He's got, he shoots, he scores, he scores, he scores. But he ran with the ball, got it to me, and I hit the jumper to tie it and put it in overtime. He tied it! He tied it! He scores! Oh! Oh! He hit the tying basket that I uh, come leaping off the floor, and Ireland says, you're going to hurt him. I said, I'm not going to hurt him. He jumped in my lap, and I was hugging him. 
Tied at 58 in overtime, Loyola held the ball, working for the final shot. Ball knocked away, and it'll be jump ball between Larry Singleton and Johnny Egan. Ball is up and tipped back to Ron Miller. He's got it. Over to Jerry Harkness. Back to Egan. 1-15. 58-58. Would you go for the one? Egan throws his considerable behind around and slams it in. <laughs> The Shingleton goes up and gets the tip. Now, that's very important because that sets up the shot heard around the world. I'm supposed to take the last shot, and we're working it down the clock. Of course, we all knew that Jerry Harkins was going to take the shot. If you've got a great player like that on the team, uh, coach is going to go with his best. So we were geared for that. I guarantee you one thing, they'll give it to Harkness when it's time. So with about four or five, I went to the basket, realizing what I what I had, and I gave us a chance, if I miss, to score, but not for them to go down and score. And I went up, but in the corner of my eye, I saw Hunter, who was wide open. So I flipped it to him. And eight, Harkness has got it, here he goes, he jumps, he passes out to Hunter, Hunter shoots, he off the rim. I just tried to position myself to take a good shot. Thought it was going in, man, it, it hit down in and came right back out. I turn and look and, and I feel very good thinking that we're going to get the rebound and we're going to get back into a second overtime with another opportunity to win. And when he shot it, I knew he had missed it and I went to box him out and I turned around as I boxed him out and as I went to the ball, I saw Ross go up over Thack and I saw, oh man. Hunter shoots, he off the rim, Ross gets the score, it's over, it's over, we won, we won, we won, we won the ball game. He looked at the replays again. Big Rouse putting his hand on my shoulders and going on my back and tipping it in. It seemed like the referee didn't see it, though. I could still picture Jerry driving and passing off to Les Hunter. And, and Les took a jump shot, and, and Vic was right there. But no time left on the clock, a couple of seconds, tipped it in. We win the national title. We won the ball game! Oh, we won. Viola won the ball game. Oh, we won it. We won. 60 to 58. We won the ball game. And George Ireland is being hugged, kissed, and squeezed. Oh, there you have it. Pandemonium. That was the end of the game. In getting that shot, uh, it was heard around the world. I mean, it, it was that simple. In the 60-58 victory, the five Ironmen of Loyola committed only three turnovers. Incredibly, they took 39 more shots than Cincinnati, yet made only one more basket. But that one was just enough.